Hello and welcome to my retro watches. This is a video that I've been wanting to film for absolute months and it is going to be the assembly of the Seiko 6138 uh, chronograph movement for my Seiko uh, bullhead which is one of my dream watches to be honest with you. This has been eight, nine months since the disassembly. And first of all, before I start with the main event, a couple of uh, worthy thanks. So I had some problems with parts um, in particular. So the hour recording wheel um, I couldn't really use. I found out that it was bent. There's actually a lot of parts in this this movement, which are still a little bit iffy. So we'll have to find out whether it's going to run at the end of this. But uh, I managed to get the our recording wheel from my friend Quan, so thank you very much for that. And then also the uh, third wheel, uh, which is in the train, uh, that also had a broken pivot. And um, many thanks to my real good friend, Mr. Simon Wilkinson, who is the Seiko champion out there. He's the one that can repair uh, Seikos for a living, and uh, he came to the rescue for me on that one. Uh, other than that, um, it, cancer got in the way, everything else got in the way but I'm now good to go. So right before I start, if any of you are watching this video to follow along to it because you're trying to repair your own watch, then please watch this to the end. Do not follow me as step by step as I go right this moment, please. That is because I've never rebuilt one of these before. I may make some mistakes. I may make some oiling mistakes as well. And therefore, if you follow along with me, you're going to make exactly the same mistakes. So if I do make a mistake, then hopefully I'm going to rectify it because I'll figure it out. So do watch it to the end. And then if you're going to uh, make your own video, uh, your own repair, then obviously uh, follow along to it thereafter. So without further ado, let's get into it. OK, so here we go into the unknown. Now, I'll just say that some of this video I'll be narrating over the top because it gives me chance to concentrate more on what I'm doing. And then other parts will be live conversation as I'm doing it. So we're starting off here with the calendar plates. I need to put this calendar plate back on before I put anything into the movement because uh, it supports the uh, barrel. So just starting here now with the center wheel 9010 mobius oil you can see the points of the morning there now we'll just stick the bridge on there we go very classic c code in its design now it's time to put the barrel on and i'm using mobius sorry it's uh, not mobius it is seiko s4 grease it's a black grease and the um, manual for this watch which it'll be down below you can click to download that states that it only uses mobius 9010 and seiko s4 uh, grease that's the only oils you'll use you can see the grease there it's horrible to apply i still haven't got used to it uh, but it seems to be pretty good so this is just a little wheel as part of the hand winding mechanism. There's the, the third wheel. And the third wheel there is a new part because the original was broken. Now here's my new product, which is uh, Elipam. I never know how to pronounce it or fix a drop. And it's a liquid. You put the uh, pallet fork in there in the escape wheel, turn it upside down, let it coat the parts for a bit. This stuff's really, really expensive, but it's now available in a very small bottle for us hobbyists. It'll dry out very quickly. And what that does, it puts a kind of film or a coating on the parts, which means that when I oil, oil the pallets, the oil will stay in place a lot longer. So it's what the professionals use. And obviously I'm aspiring to get better at uh, my watchmaking. So I thought I'd invest in that little bottle. So I'm digressing here and using now uh, some uh, Mobius D5 I think it is uh, because uh, it's a bit, bit thicker oil but I wanted to get it on that wheel I didn't think the grease would work we've now got the chronograph wheel as well that needs some 9010 before we put that in there 
now it's time for the bridge and these bridges are not easy to get into position as you can see by my fumbling around usually I like to get them on place and then of course put them on the microscope helps me line up the pivots a lot easier it's always harder to see if it's on uh, there we go we can see it now the chronograph wheels moving but it doesn't always do that without the bridge or the chronograph bridge on top of that so there we go it's on with a click trusty bit of pegwood to help the screw jobs are good at So I'm opting for a bit more D5 there on the top. I should have used the grease and really I should have greased it before I put the barrel on. And now I've used put a bit too much on as well, look, just to add insult to injury. Along comes the ratchet wheel. Easy to locate, it's on a square post. Now I'm finding out there's a little bit of a problem here. Really strange, it doesn't want to wind. This should now wind. It's going to take some investigation. So I took it all apart, put it back together again. Don't know what the problem was because now I can wind the mainspring quite happily so it must have just been a little jam in there somewhere of course the wheels aren't going to turn around until i just place the bridge to check and then there we go So it sounds all right to me. So I'll continue on with the build. This is the washer in preparation for the column wheel. We're gonna put a little bit of grease just on the outside edge. But as I can't control this grease, uh, it's also on the main plate. Now the manual suggests that you oil lots of the teeth, lots of the pillars on the or the columns I suppose on the column wheel or pillars on the pillar wheel, whichever one you call it. Um, I do it a little bit random really. This grease is so thick that I think it's going to spread as the movement works. Use a screwdriver to pull the lever out the way and then it should just drop in. So pretty much the whole of this side of the movement is uh, exactly the same as the Seiko 6139 chronograph, apart from that little drive wheel for the hand winding mechanism. This All the grease same is horrible. They probably are very slightly different. The part numbers will be different, which means they aren't compatible with one another, uh, but the principles are the same. So it's good, really. It's uh, good for me because this side I'm familiar with, so I don't have any problems with the build at all. So these are little coupling levers that lift the clutch uh, for the chronograph. So when the chronograph is stopped, it actually lifts that chronograph wheel up. Bit of the old grease in the middle there.
this screw here has got a little shoulder on it and that's so that it can just slightly keep those in place but it's not binding on them because those two levers do need to move whereas that screw there is going to hold the whole lot down so it's the only shouldered screw you'll need to find in case you've got your screws mixed up so now i'm going to oil the third wheel and the escape with 9010 and that's because this also has a little cover plate that goes on it it's actually got a hole in it as well for another part later on in the build you can just see it there next to that post near the tweezers so now it's the random grease time so this is one of the, the pushers it's in real bad condition you can see it's pitted really badly from rust but it still works so i decided to keep it uh, but i'm going to really dose it up with grease uh, because of course it slides around the manual does tell you where to grease but because this stuff as i keep saying is so damn thick um i just seem to think that a liberal amount is good enough it is after all my watch so uh, why not Just making sure it's going to slide there. Just a little bit more. Why not? And time for one of the first springs. This one has a lot of tension on it. And that is to hold back that part that I've just been lubricating. And that basically will push it back out because that's part of the pusher. So every time you push it in, that spring loads and uh, will release it back out again. There we go. But it really does hold in place. So you could knock that movement and it's probably not going to come out of its position. Um, but I guess if it did, it would fly. It would seriously fly that one. So I'm now kind of randomly using the black grease uh, in places that probably don't really need it. And I only following loosely the manual, that has to be said. So there we go, just going to oil some more of those um, columns. And if you're experiencing this movement, then you're probably seeing that maybe I'm doing it wrong compared to what you do. Uh, but my, my philosophy is that grease will transfer onto the relevant parts and it'll help keep the thing lubricated and stop the wear on the parts i mean this watch must have a lot of wear already but it still works you can see there we're operating it and that's what i'm hoping is that grease is going to get around get on all of those parts and uh, do its job so minute recording wheel now bit of oil on the pivot there that will drop straight in and that's got the heart on the other side which of course is how it all resets and here's the hammer and we need to also lubricate the parts of the hammer which do the hammering Now for the fun spring one of my favorites this one lots of different posts it's got to go over and they're usually quite bent out of shape but there we go it's loaded so far and now i've got to bend the really long bit and tuck it in over there and that's the one that also you could knock that quite easily and it could disappear so just be careful This is the final piece, intermediate driving wheel, 
and that's fitting in a non jeweled hole which is usually quite hard to locate. Now the chronograph bridge. At this point you quickly get your screws in, make sure everything's aligned up of course, you don't want to break the pivot on that chronograph wheel because they are really expensive uh, if you can find one. So I'm just loosely fitting the screws now and uh, that just helps keep the bridge in place and then I'm going to put it on the microscope and I just line up or just check that the three uh, wheels are all in their pivots and if they are then obviously I can tighten them up happy in the knowledge that I'm not going to break anything especially that chronograph wheel pivot because those chronograph wheels are really really expensive if you can even find one new as well so there we go it is good and I'm tightening it up and now we can just test the functions again, make sure the pushes are working. Nine oh one oh on the chronograph wheel and also on the minute recording wheel, but you don't oil the uh, intermediate wheel. And here we are now on the microscope and we are putting some lubrication onto the pallet fork jewel. I only do it on the escape uh, jewel, not on the leading one. And because I've used fixer drop, it should stay in place a lot longer. Two screws in the balance bridge. I believe if it's two screws, it's a balance bridge. One screw, it's a balance cock. Uh, answer that one in the uh, comments down below. So I'm now attempting to oil the uh, die shock jewel. For the balance you've got to get some 9010 right in the middle it's really hard to film and as a result it's also really hard to do and i get it in the wrong place and ultimately have to do it all over again but just trying to show you here really difficult thing to grab hold of the tweezers as you can see but you put it on the top Make sure it's in the right position. Capillary action will stick the jewel to it and jobs are good in. And now the best bit, the most rewarding bit really, fitting the balance. These Seiko balances are really interesting with the oversized or double sized bridge. Uh, and as always, I'm fitting it and it's overbanked. And rather than take the thing off, I'm going to persevere, keep tweaking it until hopefully the... Uh, Impulse jewel actually gets into the center of the pallet fork. There we go. That bit never gets old. Quick, get the screws in while you can. And um, I'm really pleased because of course you can see that that's got a good amplitude. That's going at some good speed and always a good indication. So now I'm gonna get the jewel in place as well, of course. And even that doesn't want a play ball look. And then you've got the dire shock spring. These are, well, I'm so used to doing Seiko, so I can do these uh, with ease. Um, but they're usually better to try to do under a microscope because they've got three little tangs on them and you've got to get those in a little slot, if you like. Not always easy. And as you can see, I'm applying too much pressure, really. Actually stopping the balance. So just the last one to go in and there we are also has one on the main plate but i'd pre-done that uh, before i started filming 
There we go. Balance is going. I'm really, really happy. There we go. Welcome to the dial side, and I've removed that cover plate again, so I can now gain access. So we're going to put some of the train in for the, or the, the motion works, should I say, for the hand setting, and of course the keyless works as well. So just using a bit of D5 on the centre wheel there, ready to put the cannon pinion on. Always think that needs quite a lot of lubrication. Real high friction point. Also a point that can rust if any water gets in. I've had stuck cannon pinions before on watches that you can never get out. Put the clutch in place. And more of the black gunk to put on to the winding pinion. So anybody got any easier ways to apply this Seiko S4 grease, uh, leave your comments below because I'd be really, really interested. I've been thinking about getting a butter knife perhaps and try and use it in that. I'm using a green oiler, which is the biggest oiler I think you can get. Um, and it's still just, I don't know, I need more and more practice, I guess. So it looks a bit misaligned, but it won't be when the stem goes in. Obviously, I can't see that angle from uh, where I'm sitting. It's only in edit that you can see some of the errors, if you like. So now applying far, far too much of the uh, grease just into the slot there, because that's where the yoke's going to go. Now a little bit of D5 as well on post where the yoke will sit. Keyless is all real high friction stuff so thick lubricants and greases is uh, the best place to use. There we go. And there's the little triangle stealth bomber type part. Probably really really easily lost. And now the assembly for the quick change. And uh, it's quite a difficult thing to understand the manual for me as to where to oil. So uh, I'm just trying to do my best and oil where the wheels are, roughly where the, man the, the manual says. Now a bit more of the treacle into the hole there where the setting lever is going to go and another place that uh, is susceptible to rust if any water ingress gets in so uh, good lubrication is required. And rather than oil the part before I put it in, I've decided to do it in situ and therefore get most of the black grease all over the main plate, as you can see. But again, I couldn't see this when I was recording it, so uh, <laughs> that's my only excuse. Now the yoke spring, tricky little things at the best of times.
and at this point as well it's worth noting that I should be reading the manual and not just be going off my uh, instinct put it that way So that all appears to be fitted, but then the big question is, is it? A bit more of the grease. And then a little bit more of the grease because there wasn't enough first time, let's face it. And now the Seth and Eva spring can go in place as well. Get the screws in. Click it over into place. Get the crown in place too. And then we can see if it operates. Something's wrong, and I think it's how I've fitted the spring. Further investigation required. Okay, so after a little bit of messing around, I think I've figured it out that uh, the spring goes in and it needs to go over that bit there and not over that bit there. According to the manual, that's what I'm supposed to do. So that is what I'm going to... If I can get everything in position, that is what I'm going to do. Uh, what's wrong with it now? There. Okay, we'll put the set and lever spring back on. And then lastly, that other part I also got wrong. This little cover needs to fit this way round. And now we can see better action, the action that we're supposed to see. Keyless is complete. Right guys, we are now at least two weeks later from where I left off in the keyless works because I hit an absolute massive problem 
that was a deal breaker, to be quite frank with you. Um, I filmed all the rest of the assembly and um, I was putting all of the hour recording wheel uh, reset function levers in. Couldn't think for the life of me why it wasn't working because uh, every time I tried it was really disappointed. Now I've edited this video a lot because there was quite a lot of footage going on. Uh, so I will show you little bits and pieces of that as we go along. But there was a fundamental part missing on this main plate. And just here, there should be a little post. And that post actually retains, I'm going to get the, the part now. So this is the hammer. And it sits on kind of roughly like that. And this bit is tucked underneath there. And <laughs> because it's missing, none of it would work. And this is the last part of the entire build, really, other than the calendar works. So I was absolutely mortified, to say the least. Where was I going to get a main plate from? Well, I'm going to bring this in. Probably a bit out of focus. Let's get it out. My friend, all in, Rusev if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, has kindly donated a main plate for me to complete this build. Very, very generous of him, so thank you very much. I know you'll be watching, probably laughing. So, okay, the main plate is on a bit of a slant, but we can see it here. This post is missing on this model here. And, oh, I've got the other one in. <laughs> Sorry, I've put, I've got both in the same shot and I haven't. Let's try and arrange that in such a way. They're not going to be both in focus, I don't think. But look, so, so this post is missing off here. And it's critical uh, because otherwise the reset won't work properly at all. So what I've got to do now, of course, is strip the entire movement here down. I'll probably give it yet another clean and then reassemble it onto the other main plate. So epic, because that's quite a lot of work in itself. I'm not going to film that. Maybe I'll do some, uh, some whatever you call it, time lapse on taking that one apart just for fun. So the next bit you should see will be us back at this particular juncture. Now there is something I also got wrong in the keyless works, which I will show you when I get to that point. So we're back where I left off. It was a bit of an interesting exercise just to rebuild it yet again and get familiar with the parts. So I'm at the keyless works and I said that I'd made a mistake. And I did because in the video I mentioned that the spring needed to go over a little lever and um, it didn't do it, did it? Let's face it, hopefully you, you saw that. If you didn't, maybe I'll put a clip up now. So I'm going to show you uh, how you're supposed to fit that to make it work, because if you don't get it working properly and then you reassemble the whole movement, you will then find that you can't quick set the day wheel because it won't reach. So we need this particular part. That's the assembly all in one. And I'm not sure how well this is going to come out on film because it's going to be quite tricky for me to do. Just need to set it up so that I can see what I'm doing. Because basically we've got the spring, we can see the spring here. So I put on the, um, I forgot what you're going to call it now. <laughs> anyway, I've put on this part and um, that keeps the spring in place, but it also enables us to put in the other part. So what we have to have is two pairs of tweezers and a few bits of steady hand. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the tweezers in and I'm going to move that away 
as far as I can, that spring. Then I'm going to bring in the part. It needs to be, oops, this is the other problem because you need to learn how to use tweezers with your other hands. And it's like writing with the wrong hand. It certainly is for me. So I've got to tuck in that tang in there. So it's got to go under the setting lever spring. That's the word I was looking for. And now I've got to get that over that post. Which it just doesn't want to do. There we go. And then when I let go, that spring is now in the correct position. Now don't check it just yet because we've still got a fit, which I'll probably do off camera really. I'll just bring it in. That little horrible part that holds it all in here. So I'll do that now and then I'll show you its operation. Okay, so that little support is in there. I've also still got to fit the part that goes here, which I'll show in a moment. But you can see, so if we're at, so that's winding position, quick change. So you can see it moves. And the mistake I made before, it was still moving, but as it turns out, that was not moving far enough. And that was a tip that was given to me by one of my friends, uh, Shay, Shay Fielding, who's in the group. Thanks, Shay, because without that, I would have assembled everything else and realised that I'd got it wrong. So there we go. That's the movement you're looking for. Obviously, the third position will be to change the time. And I haven't got any of the wheels in for that just yet. So for now, we'll now get this part installed. And that just locates like that and we've got a screw to go in there and I need to dress the ends of my screwdrivers because they're a bit slippy okay there we go so just double check like so so great we can now move on we'll just put in the minute wheel, the hour wheel, and the the reduction wheel, which I think is for the date driver. And I'm just going to put a bit of 9010 on there. Just a little bit on the can and pinion. And this little plastic wheel goes facing up. So on most Seikos, that faces down, so you've got two gears. It normally faces down, but on this one, it is the opposite. And then we'll get the hour wheel on. We go to set time. I'm going to do it gently because it hasn't got any bridge on it. So you can see it is turning nice and free. So all that bit is done. And now we're going to be on to the hour uh, recording wheel and the reset function for that. And let me tell you folks, I've had to practice this probably 20 times to get this bit work working right. The manual is a little bit uh, misleading. I, incidentally, I've not said it throughout the whole video. The Seiko service manual will be in a link in the description below. It's a colored version as well so uh, you can easily see what you're going to do on that one so definitely click that download it it's going to help you uh, work on these watches but like i say it's uh, it's not been without its problems because there's a few little nuances which i've had to learn and i'm going to show you those right now so we have a collection of parts that i've got here and they've all got to be fitted to the movement of course we're using a lot of 9010. So I just want to put a little bit on this post first. Now it does require a bit on this hole. And that hole is for the hour recording wheel. And the hour recording wheel is this one. But I'm also going to put just a drop. onto the bottom pivot, if I can see it. There. 
and then that will fit into that little hole. So now I need to fit the brake. The brake is this piece. And that goes on like that. It's got a little lug on the end here, so obviously you've got to make sure you put it on the right way around, not upside down. So, so far, so good. Now we get to the fun part and the bit that took me hours to figure out. That is this piece. So hopefully you can see this on my desk. It's got a big pivot or a big stem on it. And that goes through. I don't have all these other parts in the way now, unfortunately. Let's move them out of the way. So this fits in here. Like so. And I've got it in this time, first time round, perfect. Because what you want to see is that this end here goes all the way over here. It moves freely like that. What it sometimes does, and I don't know whether I can replicate it, because what it was doing to me was it wouldn't go in properly. And I guess it's to do with, as well, whether the chrono is running or is stopped. I'm just going to move the hour wheel out of the way again. So let's just try it this time. No, once again. So so you saw it jump out probably there. As I pressed the chronograph button. But I want to demonstrate. No, my luck, it's never going to happen again now. What caused me a lot of grief. There we are. Right, so you can fit it in like this and you think, OK, that's in. All lines up nicely. But if I try and bend this end, it's on a spring, you can see. And you haven't got enough movement on it. This needs to get over here nice and freely. If it doesn't, when you get your reset hammer, which is this part, that has a little post underneath, which a, you know sort of guides it into here to reset. And if this part is not right, it will never do it. And you'll spend ages trying to mess around, trying to get it right. Put in the bridge on after this as well, as anybody who's worked on one of these will know it's not easy. And I did it so many times and it never worked. And then eventually I realized that it wasn't in correct at all. So certainly having um, playing with the start stop button will help you. So I'm gonna have to reset that now and get it back into position. So the hammer is next and the hammer I need to first of all turn over it's a little end post and I need to put some of the Seiko grease, the S4 grease on there if I can because I hate this stuff so I'm going to put it over that post there and Obviously, this is the bit that was missing on the original movement. Now it's there. And you can see, because we've lined that up properly, that hammer will happily trubs. It won't happily if you do it like that. But it's in perfect alignment to slide up and down where it needs to. Now, incidentally, I haven't said anything about this yet. This here is an eccentric screw. So never touch it. It should be pointing sort of towards the reset button there. It is in the manual. So make sure that yours is set in the right position and equally this one here. So this one on the old main plate was wrong. I'll see if I could put a bit of a clip of it up now. So I had to tweak that. That needs to kind of line up with the centre of that. 
So it needs to go that way like that. Again, it is in the manual. Someone had obviously probably thought it was a screw at some point and turned it rather than was trying to get the thing to work because putting it in the wrong position, of course, it's not going to work. So we'll now put this lever on. And again, I need some grease. It asked me to put it in there because this is the pusher. So when you push the pusher, which is here, it's going to operate on this thing. It's going to see the whole mechanism. You can kind of see it working there. And we have then a spring. It's a big long spring, but not under a lot of tension. Goes in quite easily. And now the last part is another spring. And this one can be a little bit more mischievous. I like to hook it over the post there. And then if you've got it on right, you should just be able to bend that back and tuck it in there. Obviously it's a hammer, so it's going to take a bit of um, hammering. <laughs> there we go. My jokes are never brilliant. So the last bit to do now is the trickiest bit, and that is to get the bridge on. Here's the cover plate. Let's just see if I can get it in the overhead shot. And you have this jewel here. That is the barrel arbor jewel. There's the barrel arbor. But you've got obviously the minute recording pivot and then you've got the sorry that's the hour recording pivot and this is the minute pivot the minute pivot moves a little bit if you move that one uh, it'll come out of position so it's not easy and I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it on camera what I've been doing is picking it up basically holding it above it and trying to line up over the screw holes and bring it down slowly. It is really difficult. And if you've not done one before, so I've got now the hour wheel in, but the minute one isn't. I'm just conscious that I'm off camera again. So it takes a little bit of fettling. And there we go it is now down and there we go I don't know what you can see there but that's the reset hammer working okay and then we just need to check the brake function which again is going to be really hard to see because you don't see much movement down here at all personally I can't see any so I need to double check that on the microscope because it might mean that the brake has got under the minute wheel it does happen and if it does i've got to take it all off again and do it so it had gone under but i was fortunate just to get a little oiler in there and just nudge it and it's gone into position and if i show you you might see it so brake is off brake is on so on and so forth so very very slight movement but then that wheel probably doesn't move all that much if it's an hour recording wheel so I need to oil this one and then the jewels through the plate now I should have done it before which is just the escape and the third wheel jewel uh, now I'm going to do that on the microscope so unfortunately I haven't got the camera set up on that one I'm going to put a bit of d5 on here probably a bit too much then I can fit as the quick set drive wheel for the day wheel function. Oh, 
And when you're doing these sort of nylon ones, you make sure that that V on this piece is surrounding that little bump there. And this is your calendar works. This is what makes it change at 12. Just a bit of 9010 again. I have got the shakes. But just on that leading edge, because it's now time to put the calendar wheel on. Like so. And then with that in mind, the cover plates. Let's check the function works. Oh, so I didn't show you just in case you've probably seen this before on Seiko's. So this is the little spring that holds this wheel in. So you've got to put it on. There we go. Put the C-clip on. Test its operation. We're all good. So just the darling hands now. It's back in its case, and I'm not going to show you it just yet. We've got to put the um, automatic framework in for the auto works, and then just put the case back on, and we are done. So uh, let's just do this ever so quickly. Standard Seiko, as always. I just need to drop the D5 down there. And I'll put a bit more D5 down there. Enough to secure the pole lever. Thank you. 
Now the screws I'm just going to nip up, not too much because I still need to get the pull levers into position on the ratchet wheel there. Now you do also need to just put a little bit of oil around that ratchet wheel just so that it gets onto the pull levers. You can try to oil them direct, but they're not easy that way. Again, microscope does help at this stage. So I can drop the rotor on. Check that it's winding as we can see, hopefully. I nearly destroyed the entire movement by looking at the camera. And that, my friends, is it. It's finished after, <laughs> well, essentially nearly two years since I bought this watch and nearly a year really since I started thinking about videoing it. So, and what a year it's been for me uh, with various things and my illness, of course. So I'm gonna put the case back on rather than flip it over. Let's take it outside, do some glory shots of this one. You can see it as it is and uh, then we'll come back to the bench and I'll sum up the video. Here we are on the time grapher and I'm pretty impressed with the results to be honest with you. The It does fluctuate a little bit, that amplitude seems to go up and go down a little bit. The rate is fairly constant and the beat error will go from 0 to 0.1, sometimes creep up a bit more. So it's a bit odd, um, but considering this thing has got to be 50 years old, it was in a real rough shape. I am ecstatic to be honest with you that I'm getting the readings that we can see there. Uh, we can try some different positions, but um, this isn't even crown up. This is a crown on the side. So it is fluctuating and it is looking a bit um, sketchy in places. But I'm still going to take it as a win, certainly right now. Let's go all the way around. Have to remember that despite the fact the crown is here, trying to think where the balance would be on the normal watch, if you know what I mean, for the position. So we do have a little bit of a variant, but in the main, it's still looking okay as far as I'm concerned. I'll take anything of a win. Uh, we'll try and do dial down. Again, I should let that settle really, and we'll get a better reading. But, you know, I'm impressed. It's over two in amplitude. It's not super perfect, but it is better than I was expecting. As we know, this watch was in rough, rough, rough condition. So definitely a win on the time grapher. Right guys, that 
is the end of the video. The bull head is on the wrist and what a watch it is. It's proper heavy, keeps sliding over my knuckles. Uh, but icon of the 70s, watch I really wanted to own and now I've got one and it finally works. Can you believe that I bought this from Quan, my friend, 13th of September, 2020. So we are two years in the making of this watch. I can't believe it's taken me that long to be quite honest with you. So uh, I'm really impressed with it. I hope you have really enjoyed watching me repair this one and get it working again. Now, I've had it actually on the wrist for two or three days and I've had some problems with it. So uh, it isn't completely 100% working and in order. So the first problem is the uh, hour recording um, hand, I suppose, or that whole mechanism creeps. So when the chronograph is stopped, it still wants to run. And the thing is, it's not running like the chrono be running. So the brake is clearly touching the wheel, but not enough. So I think it was, it crept about four or five hours over a 12 hour period. So I'm gonna to have to go back in and investigate what that is or how I'm gonna be able to adjust that. I'm thinking it's possibly something to do with one of those springs or that funny little spring. Um, maybe just need to be a bit tighter. Uh, but for now, I really don't wanna take it apart again. And then what also happened uh, was the problem right at the start, if you went back and watched episode one of this, and that was that the chronograph would stop in and around three, four minutes to uh, 12, but it was completely random. So it ran one day for nine hours continuously before it did it, and I stopped, reset it, and then did it again, and it stopped at around, I don't know, an hour, hour and a half. So um, as it's always stopping at the same point, you think, well, that's gotta be a wheel, it's gotta be a tooth or something. What it actually was is the chronograph wheel has got like a little hook thing that comes around, and then it touches the intermediate wheel or well, the intermediate driving wheel for the recording of the minutes. And that wheel had a tiny bit of rust inside one of the teeth. And um, I didn't notice that and it didn't clean out. This watch parts has probably been through the cleaning machine five or six times and it didn't get rid of it. I didn't notice it. Uh, I've now taken that out and so far, touch wood, it hasn't done it. it still might, that's the problem. The gears feel really, really free. Uh, and obviously because it's quite random, it's not happening at a specific time, every time within an hour. Um, so I'm hoping it is just that little speck of rust is just dragging it somehow or stopping it. it doesn't take much to stop a watch. I did a video called that, I think. Uh, so there we go, that's it. Please leave all your comments below. I'm gonna read every one. I'll try and reply to as many as I can. I'm hoping that you're gonna have enjoyed this video. I've estimating it's going to be quite long by the time I've edited it. Um, but oh, I'm really, really pleased to have it on the wrist. Um, what's coming next? I'll put a photo of it up now. I'll hold it up because you probably won't be able to see it. I've got this John Power watch, which has got, I think it's a 17 jaw movement in it. So it's not actually too bad. Again, photo of the movement, but it's in real poor condition. And there's a reason why I want to restore this one. Um, but you'll have to wait until I do the video. I'm gonna start filming that in the next few days. Um, so like I say, leave your comments below. If you're new to the channel and you've enjoyed this video, consider subscribing. That would be very nice. Of course, hit the like button. Everybody hit the like button, please, because that really, really does help the channel grow. And uh, I'd be very appreciative of it. Lastly, of course, health. I'm always gonna mention health. If you're new to the channel, I'm still in recovery from prostate cancer. And I just wanna tell everybody, please, uh, if you're age, uh, say 45 upwards, continue to have a PSA blood test as, uh, every two or three years at least. Pick this disease up early and you could have the good prognosis that hopefully I have got because I'm still waiting for my results to give me the all clear. Uh, there'll be a link down below to Prostate Cancer UK should you want to find out any more information. Certainly uh, read up on the symptoms. Um, please be aware guys, because it is a silent killer. Uh, I had absolutely no symptoms. I've just turned 50. Uh, so it could happen to me, it could happen to you, it could be happening to you right now and you wouldn't know. Uh, so if you do get the symptoms, potentially you're a lot further down the line. 
and therefore treatments are slightly different for you. So please look after yourselves. No one else is going to do it for you. Take control of your health. That's my message. It'll be my message in most of my videos, certainly until I calm down and feel a little bit normal again. Thanks very much for watching. See you in the next one. Bye for now.